All right, welcome everybody. Um, it's very nice to be here. Uh, we're going to be giving a talk today about Rust, Kubernetes, and the cloud. Um, but before we get started, uh, who are we? Well, I'm Ryan Levick. Um, I'm a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft, and I spend all my days and weekends and nights thinking and dreaming about the Rust programming language. Hi, everyone. I'm Taylor Thomas. I am also a developer at Microsoft. I am uh, I am working more in the cloud side, the cloud native, as we like to call it in buzzword uh, language. Um, I work more on that side. Um, I do more than a little bit than Dream and Rust, and that is no knock against Ryan because Ryan is quite good at Rust. But I uh, do a, a lot of things with Kubernetes um, and have for a while. And basically, uh, a lot of my career has been in the cloud space. So that's kind of my background. So we're, we're talking about the Rust programming language today. Uh, maybe you've heard of it before. Um, but today, we're going to be talking about how Rust um, has come to find a home at Microsoft, um, how we think about Rust uh, at Microsoft, um, and uh, sort of where Rust fits in in the, the cloud space um, today. Um, and to begin with that, we're going to talk about uh, Microsoft's problem, our problem. Um, and it's not just our problem, it's really our all problem. Um, it's a problem that the software industry in general has. Um, and that is the fact that our systems are more interconnected and performing more and more tasks every single day. Um, but along with that, what that means is that our systems are more vulnerable and attackers have more incentive to attack us. Um, and so you might be thinking, OK, what does that have to do with Rust? Well, if we look at, over time, the number of CVEs, that's the most secure um, security, or the most uh, serious security vulnerabilities over time, you can see that the number is just going up. Um, this stops at 2018, but over the past three years, it's basically been um, the same story. Um, it's going up and up and up. Um, fortunately, we see a little bit less of those vulnerabilities being actually exploited in practice, but that's not uh, out of magic or anything like that. That's just out of spending a lot of money on the problem, uh, basically by hiring great security engineers um, and by paying a lot of money in bug bounties and things like that um, so that there's less incentive to exploit it. But that costs us, um, us, Microsoft, and us, the industry, a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money, and it's just a lot of headache. How much does this cost um, exactly in, in kind of dollar figures? Um, well, here is a figure, $150,000. And you might think, oh, that's not a lot. Well, this figure is about 20 years old. Um, it's unfortunately the latest figure that we have. It's from around 2002, I think. Um, and that's per CVE that we have. Um, and it's basically just the cost of addressing the CVE directly. It does not take into account the headache that the customer had to go through, support costs, um, shipping new code out. It's really just addressing um, the bug itself um, that happens in production. Um, so this figure is probably much larger nowadays because our systems are much more complex. And how many of these do we have every year? This figure is a little bit more uh, recent, but um, I think this was 2019. We had 468 of them. Um, and so if you just think that we're spending just on addressing the issue directly um, in the tens of millions uh, of dollars and, and $2,002 figures, um, that's a lot of money. Um, and that, again, does not take into account all the headache that comes with it, the cost to the customer of actually shipping um, uh, patches um, and, and things like that. So it's, it's really um, a, a quite a big deal. And really, at the core of this problem, at the core of our problem as a software industry, um, is the fact uh, of memory safety, or rather, memory unsafety. Um, the fact that a lot of these security vulnerabilities come from exploiting the incorrect use uh, of memory. And if you look at um, the percentage of these very uh, severe um, security vulnerabilities, about 70% of them um, are due to memory safety issues, so the incorrect use uh, of memory safety. And then 30% of them don't have to do with that. They're kind of logic bugs or something like that. So it kind of stands to reason if we can address this, this memory safety issue, the incorrect use of memory, then presumably 70% of our worst security vulnerabilities will just disappear 
Um, and that would be fantastic. Wouldn't mean that our systems are magically completely secure, um, but 70% going away is uh, means we can focus our, our time and attention on that 30% and really try and hone in uh, on those, which would be a fantastic thing. Um, is Rust the answer to this? You may not know this, but Rust is a systems programming language that is 100% um, memory safe. And so um, if you don't have uh, that, um, if you don't, uh, if you use Rust, then you don't have the issue of memory safety because Rust is 100% safe. It is a, a language that kind of addresses this problem at the core. Um, if you use safe Rust, then you can be sure that your systems are 100% safe. Um, and along with this, you're not kind of sacrificing um, performance that you you would have. Now, memory safety is is typically um, you know in the realm of when you're using languages like C and C++. You might be thinking to yourself, I'm a C sharp developer or Java or or JavaScript or or, or whatever you're using, um, and and we don't have these memory safety issues. Um, that might be true for, for your particular applications, but I still implore you to um, think about this because you're running on top of system software, um, the software that you rely on, like your database, um, your operating system, all the tools that come around with it usually are written um, in these uh, uh, these memory unsafe languages like C and C++. Um, and with Rust, we can replace those languages and still keep the reason that we use those languages in the first place, which is usually performance and control. On top of that, and related to memory safety, is the idea of correctness. So when we're when we use Rust, we get a lot of uh, features in the language that are there in order to make sure that the programs that we're writing are correct, um, that we don't have bugs in them. Now it's totally possible to write bugs uh, in Rust. Um, Taylor and I, we have both written our fair share of bugs uh, in Rust. But one thing that's kind of hard to quantify is that when you do write. Uh, Rust code, you tend to write code that is less buggy than in other languages. And that includes languages um, with garbage collectors like C Sharp or Java. Um, so this is a, you know, we don't have kind of numbers to really um, concretely say how much this is true, but it is certainly something that we're finding anecdotally to be true. Um, and along with that, you know, you you can become highly productive um, in this language. Um, if you've heard anything about Rust before, you've probably heard that it has a steep learning curve, um, that it's not the easiest language in the uh, in the world to to learn, and that can certainly be true. Um, but it's definitely not the hardest one to learn. Um, if you've ever learned uh, to use C or C plus uh, plus correctly in a way where you do not have um, bugs and uh, incorrect use of memory, that, that oftentimes takes years uh, of training. Um, and in Rust, uh, that, that typically lasts you know, three or four weeks uh, of learning. Um, and once you reach that level, the productivity really takes off. Um, and you can, write, um, you can write systems that are correct, that do what they uh, need to do, are relatively bug-free um, in, a, in a time frame that's much faster um, than you potentially would in, in other languages, which is is fantastic. And then above all else, um, you can tell I'm a I'm a big fan of Rust. Um, you know, you might be thinking this guy up here on on my screen is just uh, you know spouting the Rust gospel, but I don't um, you know I don't you know he's just one person. Um, but I'm not alone. Um, you know, Stack Overflow submits their um, yearly survey for developers. Uh, and Rust for the past five years has been number one on that list. Um, and uh, so, you know, it seems to be that other people also um, in, enjoy this language. Um, so, you know, even if you don't think Rust is right for you, it, it could be a fun language to learn and it, it is uh, at times a, a joy to use. Really at the core of this is that Rust, um, uh, that we want to reduce the use of memory on safe languages like C and C++ um, through the use of, uh, of Rust. Um, th the fact of the matter is that C and C++ are here to stay. They're not gonna go anywhere anytime soon. There's just far too much software written uh, in them. Um, I'm not proposing that we completely stop writing C++ or that we just uh, rewrite everything uh, in Rust because that's just simply Im impractical. Even if I had, uh, you know, even if I wanted that to be true, it would be far too costly and take far too long for that to ever actually be true. Um, so it's really about reducing the, the, our dependence on these memory unsafe languages um, and instead relying 
um, on a safe language for the most critical systems um, that we have. And this raises the question for a lot of people, I'm assuming in the science, you're like, but wait, I'm using C sharp or I'm using, and but what if I'm using this memory safe language? So that's a really good question. And that's something I want to address because um, like I said, my experience is coming from those in, in the cloud world, coming from those, um, that, that background of memory safe languages, whether that's doing something like Go, which is my, which is my original background. Um, you have, uh, this is the Go gopher, in case you're not sure. Rust is a, a crab because we're Rust stations and Go's or Go, Go programmers or gophers. Um, and so this is the Go mascot. And, I, and a lot of people who do things, especially with Kubernetes, do things with Go. And people always say, but wait, my language is already memory safe. And so I wanted to address that a little bit, but in context of a project that we have called Crustlet. Uh, Crustlet is a, uh, we're gonna talk a lot about it. I'm gonna show a lot of demos around it. And um, we're, we're gonna get into the demo thing. We wanna kind of explain why we're even talking about Rust here in this um, in, in this conference. Like, well, well, why Rust? What does this have to do with Azure? Well, that's what we're getting into here. So Crustlet is a project we started that is essentially a Kubernetes kubelet which if you are not familiar with Kubernetes is the node aspect. So it's what run it, it's what runs on every node in a cluster of uh, Kubernetes nodes. And that thing connects it to the main API and, and registers and does all those tasks. And so we wrote a kubelet in Rust. And for what crazy purpose you might ask, that's actually for uh, WebAssembly or WASM, which you saw was also one of the most loved languages on there. That's just a little aside, but um, we are doing a lot of things with WebAssembly, which is somewhere where we see the cloud moving towards um, here in the near future, just because of its uh, its ability to run on multiple systems, um, have a lot smaller footprint than normal containers. But Crestlet allows you to try it in something that's somewhat familiar. If you're new to if you're new to cloud, you've probably at least heard of Kubernetes. And if you've been in the cloud for a while or are in the process of moving over, you have probably touched it in some way. And so Crestlet. Um, allows you to just basically load it, and we'll show that today, load it straight into something like AKS, and then go um, go and just run WebAssembly modules, which are the binaries that are generated from WebAssembly. So before we talk about that, I just want to say that's kind of the context that I'll show some of these demos in here, but why did we choose Rust over a memory safe language like Go? So the first point that I always like to point out is traits. Uh, if in the Rust system, there is a, a concept called traits. And if you are familiar with most other languages, they're called interfaces in, in other languages, but they're kind of a step above. Um, traits allow you to express um, basically the desired behavior like an interface would, but um, you can use those traits as bounds inside of your functions for, for generics. But more importantly, there's things such as uh, what we like to call the conversion traits. These um, if you've heard, if you've experimented with Rust at all, you've probably seen ASREF. There's things like ASREF, DREF, whole bunch of them, and all of these traits allow you to actually um, convert types over or use a type as another type um, in a very, very safe and generic way. They're just very flexible and powerful, and we'll kind of go over some some examples of that in a little bit. Next off is mac. Uh, next up is macros. So uh, macros are a common thing in many languages, but Rust macros are beautiful. That'll probably be the first example I show. Um, this is this. There's a few things like I try to always keep it real for everybody um, as we as we talk the, about these things. Like I, I don't want to come off as a fanboy, but macros is one of the things I will gush about. Uh, it makes code so nice to write, and particularly in a cloud environment, just because you're interacting with so many APIs and, and so many different things where the combination of something that has traits that you can then reuse a bunch of code with ease, and then the macros allow you to generate code without having to store a bunch of weird things, like what happens with Go and Kubernetes. Um, and we'll show some examples of that in a little bit. The next thing we really love is the error handling and iteration tools. So if you're familiar with uh, link style program or anything from the, the functional programming world, a lot of that is available in Rust. And um, it goes together with the error handling because error handling is their values, but they're, va they're values that have to be handled or they raise a compiler warning. Um, and the, tool for, the tools for handling those errors are really, really nice. You're able to map one, like a type into another type, or if it is an error, do something um, all with, with relative ease. 
And then you have the iteration tools as well that allow you to go into um, filtering and mapping and collecting. You can basically do um, an example of, of uh, filtering or um, putting out a bunch of asynchronous tasks, basically a fan out, fan in job in a very, very short um, amount of code. We're talking 10, 15 lines. And that's really, really incredible for, uh, for a language. And especially when you do a lot of things like that um, with data massaging and things in, in cloud computing. And last, or not last, but one of the other things we really, we really like is dependency management tooling. Um, now, dependency management is a hard problem to solve in general. Uh, but the dependency management and build tool chain for Rust, which is called Cargo, is very, very powerful and very useful. Um, I have fought a lot in languages like Go that are just a nightmare to upgrade any dependent because you have to get the right SHAs and do all these things. And, and even with ones that are, that are a little bit more uh, fully featured, you still have a lot of problems with dependency resolution and what if I want to try out something locally or patch something and, and Cargo makes that very, very easy for you. It is just, uh, that's one of the other things I will gush about is Cargo just because it is so powerful and useful. And that's why we, that's, those are some of the big reasons we chose like Rust over something like Go. And last off is that mentioning of correctness. So memory safety, obviously, like we, we mentioned, like things like Go and Java and C Sharp are, are, memory, are memory safe. They're, they're meant to be memory safe, but they're not necessarily correct in their usage of things. So a quick example of this from the Kubernetes world. So I actually just recently stepped down as a core maintainer of the Helm project, but I, I worked on that for a long time. Once again, if you are familiar with Kubernetes, you've probably heard of Helm, which is a package manager for Kubernetes. And we discovered, we've discovered over the years, several bugs that were race conditions, not detected by the race checker in Go or anything. And the that bug actually would have been completely impossible in Rust because it has caught us. What, what generally happens as you're learning Rust is you see something, you're like, no, this is right. And the compiler's telling you, no, you're wrong. And you're like, no, but I am right. And then you like sit there and you look through it and you dig through, you're like, oh, oh, I'm accessing that data when I don't have actual, like something else could be accessing it simultaneously or I don't have the correct ownership over it. And so that correctness is very, very um, important to us as we've been coding things for the cloud. So this also brings up the other question, why not Rust for the cloud? Like when's reasons you should or shouldn't use Rust for the cloud? So let's talk about that. The first thing is the async um, env environment. So async was something that was added um, a little bit later in Rust's development. It's still technically very new. It's about a year, year and a half old um, in terms of being in the stable branch. Um, and it has some rough edges still. Now that's not to say that it's not that it's impossible or overly difficult, but and that but there's currently lots of work being done here. There's a current or there's a work group that was started that's gathering different requirements and things from community members to make the async story better. But it is if you're used to something like Go in particular, where you can just say Go run something like just go do a function, uh, you're going to have a lot of rough edges to get used to. But like I said, there's a correctness benefit that comes from using async with Rust. Another thing is that the ecosystem can sometimes be immature for cloud usage. Uh, a quick example here is we were trying to do something like uh, parsing a multi multi part uh, data from an HTTP request. Turns out basically all the libraries only support multi part form. And so if you're trying to send uh, any other kinds of data, now that's something like really simple and really small, might only affect some projects, but you'll find lots of gaps like that uh, because people haven't really used all of it in the cloud until recently, in my opinion, at least. And so just be aware that the ecosystem is a little immature sometimes in that area. Um, now, like Ryan mentioned, there is a learning curve to Rust, and it really is just the initial learning curve. I like to call it logarithmic, and don't take that in like an extreme way. It's just that's what the curve looks like. You kind of have this initial period of where it's just a very sharp curve as you kind of have to learn things about like the borrow checker and ownership in Rust and, and how all those things function. But really, um, it, th this comes into play when you're trying to do something quickly. If you want to throw a team onto a new project in Go, they'll be able to, and a small, but a small project in Go, they will get it done quicker if they've never done Go compared to if they've never done Rust. But like I said, there's, there, it's only a small curve and the benefits, you're back to normal productivity after about three or four weeks. 
All right. So I think now we're going to be going to a demo to show off what Rust code looks like. Um, well, this is a very short presentation, um, and so it's we're not going to be able to uh, uh, show what um, you know how Rust works. Uh, this is not a Rust 101 uh, course or something like that. This is really meant to be kind of a, um, an overview of what um, you might experience if you use Rust. So don't worry if you don't understand every line. You, if you haven't done Rust before, you certainly won't. But this should just give you a flavor um, of, of what that kind of looks like. All right, so I'm sharing my screen here now. And hopefully, you should be um, able to see um, what I have going on here. Um, and this is a, a simple project that I've started. Um, and what you're looking at right here um, is the cargo.toml file for my project. This is a Rust project. Cargo is Rust's build tool slash dependency manager slash test runner. Kind of does everything around building and testing and running um, Rust. And this is sort of a manifest file um, describing some uh, metadata about my project, like the name, um, the version, you know, who the author was, and things like that. And then down here, this is kind of one of the best parts about, um, about Rust, is the dependency management is quite simple. So I'm going to be using two um, of our libraries um, from, from Azure here. One is Azure Core. Um, the other one is Azure Cosmos, because we're going to be writing a small little demo with Cosmos DB. Then I'm going to be using Tokyo, which Tokyo is an async runtime. Now, Rust, because it's a systems programming language, doesn't have a runtime built into it like JavaScript does or C Sharp does. Um, you have to provide uh, the, the runtime for you. What's really great about that is that you can switch runtimes out depending on your use case. So if you need something that runs on a Raspberry Pi, that might be very different than something that runs on a beefy server um, in Azure. And this allows you to kind of switch them out um, uh, uh, to, to use which one you want to use. And then request here um, is a simple uh, HTTP library that runs on top of, of Tokyo that we're going to be using to actual, actually power the HTTP requests um, that we make uh, to Azure here. And then I'm going to pop on over here to our um, main.rs file. This is kind of everything that we, we have so far in our little um, uh, app that we have going here. Um, you can see that we have a main function that's going to be run automatically when we run our binary. Um, and it's annotated with this funky thing here called Tokyo main. And that's because normally main functions, just like in C, are not asynchronous. Um, but this little um, Tokyo main annotation here allows you to make your main function um, asynchronous, and it builds a Tokyo runtime for you and runs your main function on that runtime. So it's very, uh, there's a lot going on here um, underneath the hood, but you get very nice, short, concise um, annotations that help you um, build up your application. This is an example of what Taylor was talking about with macros. This Tokyo main here is a macro that is generating some code for running um, our code on a Tokyo runtime. Um, the code is quite simple. Um, for what it does, we're going to pass in a, a Cosmos primary key, the, the name of our Cosmos account here. We're going to build, uh, get an authorization token based on, um, on our primary key. We're going to build up here an HTTP client that actually will power our HTTP requests. This is because our Cosmos um, client, all the Azure uh, SDK clients that we are building right now, um, are uh, agnostic to what H underlying HTTP library that they use. So you can plug in your favorite HTTP library, and that's what will be used by the um, by the the various uh, libraries that we're building for Azure. Now, I, I just want to mention one other thing um, about the um, the Azure uh, SDK that we're we're using here today. I'm going to pop back over here. You may notice that I'm getting these dependencies from from Git, um, from GitHub, whereas these other ones, I'm um, just specifying their versions. That's because these two, um, Tokyo and Request, are coming from the centralized Rust library store. The libraries in Rust are called crates. This is coming from crates.io, which is something that you can think of like uh, NPM or, or some kind of um, package store. That you that you might use, um, we do not yet publish these on crates.io. Our, our Azure SDKs are not currently on crates.io because they're under heavy construction right now. Um, it's it was a community project and has been moved onto the Azure um, organization as a alpha, unsupported, um, unofficial SDK. So 
while we do have Microsoft people working on it full time, um, I, you know, I'm, I, I work on it quite often, um, as does Taylor. Um, it's not yet um, to the point yet where we can provide official support where you can you know, call somebody up and have them help uh, you with it. But we hope to one day get to that point. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad software or anything like that. It's just we, when we say it's an officially supported SDK, that's a very, very high standard that we're not quite ready um, to grant the Azure uh, SDK for Rust quite yet. Um, so uh, what I want to go ahead and, and do here real quick um, is uh, try and show how to make a request uh, to Cosmos DB using our Cosmos client to just fetch the various databases um, that I have um, inside of uh, my Cosmos DB account that I have here. So um, if we type out Cosmos client here, and you can see there's a whole bunch of um, methods that come with this. Um, and I can call list databases here. Um, and then I can call execute because list databases just gives us back a, a request object um, that we can we can add some um, additional optional features to. Um, and then we're going to call um, execute on it and then await on the result of calling uh, execute. And then we can store that into a variable um, that I'll call response here. Now you'll notice. Um, uh, I didn't type this result thing right here. This is not me typing it, but this is um, Rust's uh, Rust Analyzer plugin extension for VS Code that gives some very nice um, additional information uh, about um, our Rust code. So it's telling me the type here. And the result type here is just saying that this operation might fail, it might error out. And error handling in Rust is real nice and easy. All you have to do is add a question mark here, and it basically pops the error out from the main function and returns an error if our, um, our call to execute errors here. Pretty plain and simple. And then in order to get the names of our databases that we have here, um, we can go ahead and do something like, um, we'll call print line here. Um, and then I'm just going to say the lists, or sorry, the databases are going to be um, the response dot databases, um, and we have to, uh, sorry, we have to call um, dot iter here, and then uh, map. Um, and we get each uh, database in turn, and then we can call db um, dot name. That gets the name of the database, um, and then we collect all of these um, to get. Oops, and I'm in the wrong place here. We collect all of these into a vector, which is basically like an array um, of string objects, just like this. So if you've not done uh, Rust before, you might be you know, confused at some of the syntax and stuff like that. That's part of, uh, of learning Rust. Um, but uh, this hopefully uh, should work. And I'm just going to pop up um, this uh, here. You know, This is a terminal right here. And I'm going to go ahead and run cargo run, which will build and run my executable. Uh, um, and we'll see what it, what it says. I've already set the Cosmos primary key and Cosmos account in my environment. Um, and it should hopefully. Um, work out just fine, and uh, and there we go. So I do have one database in my account. It's the test one database, and we have been successfully able to use the Azure SDK for Rust in its current form in order to fetch that um, from my Cosmos um, account. So nothing new here. You probably are already doing this with your SDKs in your current language, but it goes to show that Rust being a systems language doesn't mean that it's a huge verbose monster. Um, we, ha we actually have a lot of high level um, kind of link style, functional programming style, um, very um, modern uh, error handling um, uh, that you can use in this in the systems database, and, and we don't even rely on a garbage collector um, in order to get it done. Um, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and we're going to head over to Taylor um, for his demo. Yep. And so, just while I'm starting my uh, my screen share, I just wanted to, to point out like that. I love how uh, simple we're able to go and iterate over day. Like that's one of those things is if, if you're in the cloud world, you're, um, you're basically going to be like mashing data around and doing things, but you were able to quickly pull in, um, 
all the all the information from mm -hmm. from that that project and and then just iterate across it and and mash all the, the stuff together just all in one quick I mean that that entire thing was when you formatted it like eight lines when you didn't yeah. have it formatted it was two lines and yeah. so that's just you're combining these all these awesome correctness guarantees we've talked about with the mapping function so we just wanted to point out to people because people here are interested in and using Azure that you can start using these things yes these some of these things are under construction like the SDK but if you're interested in doing it and you want to interact with the Azure APIs there are tools there um, that you can even at this point if you were to start using them in the next few months be able to give us important feedback and say hey I found this bug I need this feature why doesn't it do this or um, oh I really like this can you make the other things do it like this or whatever mm -hmm. you want to do so just something good to point out from that code so here, I just wanted to actually first and uh, first foremost share my some things about Crestlet. So now we're going to go into the Kubernetes portion of this. We talked a little bit about Azure. Now we're going to talk about Kubernetes, Azure, and REST all together. Uh, so uh, right here is the Crestlet project. You can find it on Deus Labs Crestlet on GitHub. But um, before I start with kind of showing some of the cool things that REST can do for you, I'm going to um, first start off uh, basically adding Crestlet to an AKS uh, cluster for you. So we have something that walks you how, through how to do this. Inside the docs folder, you actually can see uh, various examples. Inside our how to, we have it for pretty much every kind of major uh, cloud provider, but here on Azure, you'll see that it has a very, very quick guide. So the first thing you'll need to do is create a service principle, which I've already done. Um, and then make sure you have an SSH key, but then you have this deploy to Azure button. So I'm gonna move over here where I already clicked on that and I'm gonna um, create a new resource group called, I'm just gonna call it Krusty because Krusty the Crab and also Crestlet. Um, and then um, I'll just put this, I like to put things, actually since we're doing it in Europe, I will find a area over in the EU. Let's do, let's do West Europe. And then um, basically all the things are all set up for you. You can even specify your Kubernetes version. I'm actually gonna specify we recently released a newer version of Crestlet 0.7. So I'm gonna change it to make sure it downloads that. And that's it. All I have to do is then do the review and create, let it validate the template. Um, oh, it looks like it failed. Let's see what I did. Because of course I am angering the demo gods. Oh, I might not have permission. So here, I'm gonna switch up this to here and we'll do it in West Europe. Okay. So we'll go ahead and create this now. And in the background, um, I'll let it run while I run through some of my examples. So this is, uh, if you are familiar with Azure, which I'm imagining almost all of you are, this is very simple, just following your normal kind of Azure deployment um, template uh, framework. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that and then we'll um, show some things here inside of code. So I wanted to show a little bit more on Rust and then show how we're using Crestlet with some actual demos of this. But the first example and probably the most important example I wanna show you is um, how to do, uh, how macros can do some really interesting and cool things for you. So I'm gonna go over to a project called Crater. This is a crate we released that allows you to write uh, Kubernetes operators in Rust. And so if that's something that interests you, this is probably a good place to start because uh, Kublet, our Kublet is actually built on this, this crate um, that, we, that we've created. So this actually, we're hoping to make a something that's sep completely separate from the Crescent project in the future. But there's a great example in here that shows um, how um, you can use macros and things to your advantage. So, uh, Inside of Kubernetes, this is this is a part where we're getting to a little bit of prior Kubernetes knowledge. I'm going to explain a little bit, but if anyone has any questions, please feel free to drop those in in chat or in Discord, and I can and I can answer those. But inside of Kubernetes, you have Kubernetes resources, and all of them kind of have a similar uh, similar look to each other. They have a, a very common set of of parameters that are set with them, um, but there's also a a type of resource in Kubernetes called a custom resource or a CRD. Um, a, and that stands for custom resource definition. This allows you to basically add on arbitrary APIs to the Kubernetes API. And then it starts handling them like normal Kubernetes objects. And then you can write controllers 
um, or pieces of software that can handle those objects and do things for you. So people do this to set up things like uh, cl uh, various clusters that need to be orchestrated. Um, so like database clusters are, are a common thing you'll see. Also to set up custom resources for, you, for your uh, company. Um, that's also quite common. So this one is a funny one that uses uh, Moose uh, as, the, as the example. But we have this um, custom resource uh, derived that, that's going on. So these are all macros here at this top level. And let, let's kind of walk through what this is all doing for you. So if you're used to doing this, probably in Go, you might have also done it in Python or another, another language, but you have to generate a lot of code. So you have to generate, you have to create your object and then you have to generate the code for that object that does, that creates the client for it and the handling for it. And then you have in Go, at least you have to commit that code. I don't know if if other languages have to, but um, either way, there's still a bunch of, of code generation that has to go on. So instead of having like an out of band generation step or, or these things that happen with other um, with other languages, we have just this custom resource derived, and this does a whole bunch of magic that creates all of that client stuff for you when you build the project. So this doesn't um, clog up your code base with all this other kind of just scaffolding glue code that's in there. Um, these other things such as serialize and deserialize, these derive an implementation for a powerful library in Rust called CERTI, uh, which stands for serialize, deserialize. Um, and basically any um, data model that has an implementation, so we're talking TOML, YAML, JSON, um, message pack, any of those things can now serialize or deserialize these objects um, into their specific message format. Um, so there's no extra like attaching it on, it's just you, you derive those two things. And then it, this also has the bonus of adding on a JSON schema. So for those, for those of us who consume a lot of APIs, there's often these schemas that we need to use to apply or check or validate things as they come in. And once again, I do almost no work and get a full JSON schema validation for this type by basically specifying this derive and then um, specifying a few attributes for the, in this case, the custom resource. And so this does all the heavy lifting for me um, to generate those things. So in, in Go, which is like I said, my, the, mo the one I'm most familiar with, this would be hundreds if not thousands of lines of code. And we have done it in 13 lines and that's formatted. If we wanted to really squish it down, we could have this be like five or six. Um, so this is something that is, for me, having done so much of this in Go and seeing what is done in other languages is really, really powerful and useful because you're often interacting with APIs. Even if it's not Kubernetes, you can have these derives and things that just make um, writing something for the cloud and interacting with APIs and massaging that data like I talked about, a very, very simple process. And so um, we'll, we'll go ahead and actually try to run these example, this example in a little bit. I'll see because right now it's a, uh, I think it's under some active construction on the uh, on the main branch, but um, it really gives us some some uh, power there to to do what we need to. And another thing that we find very useful, uh, particularly in the cloud world, that we didn't mention before, is something called features. So um, I'll show you actually what this looks like. So inside of Kubelet, inside of this, the cargo file that we talked about that we were showing that uh, Ryan was showing earlier, you can see um, this that it's declaring the Kubelet, it's saying our version, all the different things that are in there. But then um, you see this feature section, and large libraries generally have this. Now what this does is allows you to selectively import code and turn on and off things you don't need with ease. Um, so the way we use this quite a bit is. Uh, with the derive feature, but also the CLI feature. So the CLI feature um, is an optional thing. If you want to build this into your own CLI, we have all the, the plumbing there to do that. But if you're not using it and you want to use it purely as a library and something else, you can do that without pulling in the heavier dependency of struct which is a command line flag parser. Um, so basically we now have this dependency down here that doesn't get imported at all unless you specifically ask for it to be imported. But this also goes into code. And so inside of here, we have this, uh, this config object. Now this config file, this config thing's a little gnarly. There's a bunch of stuff going on in here. But 
a lot of different things. Like we're not importing in things unless we need it. So this is just saying, if I have a feature called CLI, please import this code. But this also goes down, I'm gonna have to scroll down to get to it, sorry. The actual struct that does all the parsing. So we're basically not importing an entire struct based on whether or not we enabled a feature. Um, and so right here, you'll see that we have the, if, if we have CLI set or if we're building our, our documentation, then we are going to use it. And so these things add on, you can also conditionally build parts of your code depending on your operating system. Um, all these things are very, very useful when you, you have something that you want to run on any system anywhere and only import exactly what it needs. So when you build the stuff for, um, for your Windows code or for, your, for Mac OS, if there's some, like in our case where there's a bug we had to work around, then we, um, we are able to only do, pull in those fixes or those hacks when we need them. And so it's really, really powerful. So let's go ahead and now that I've kind of talked about the code, if anyone wants to see something else, some more explanations, feel free to drop questions, but we can look back here and we see that um, our, our deployment is complete. So now I can actually go into a normal um, AKS sim, uh, style workflow. So let's go ahead into a terminal. And here in the terminal, I'm on, uh, I'm in the Crestlet repository. I'm actually on a branch because I like to uh, live on the edge. Um, and so right here, we're going to go ahead and just first pull down our credentials. If you're not um, if you're not familiar, it is AKS credentials. Actually here, I'm just gonna pull it from the doc so you can see what this looks like. So this is actually in the documentation that I was showing earlier. So if we go into the docs and the how to and back to that um, Azure, because as much as I've done AKS, I have. I always have to um, look up the uh, the command again, and then I have to remember my resource group, which is called Krusty. So, so the name is Crestlet, and I'm going to call. And my resource group is called Krusty. So this will actually go fetch the credentials, put them into your local kube config if you're uh, new to um, Kubernetes, and it's going to tell me I already have it because I. I uh, had one before as I was testing this. But now I'm actually talking to that cluster. You can see if I do kube control cluster info, it's gonna return information about the cluster, maybe if it decides to, there we go. And then um, we can see that um, our, our uh, agent is running against the, um, the API. So this, uh, this Crestlet WASI node is actually going to allow us to rev run WebAssembly modules inside of Kubernetes, which we're going to show right now, which is really cool. And like I said, you don't have to use this to, um, to run WebAssembly modules if that's not your thing. The point of this is to show that we were able to use Rust to build a very powerful Kubernetes application, which is kind of becoming one of the de facto things for running in the cloud in Rust without... Um, lots of cruft and extra bloat and really in a, in a powerful and safe and correct way. And so let's go ahead and show that. So now that we have that node running, I'm gonna go ahead and run um, a few examples. Sorry, wrong one. Let's go ahead and start off with Hello World Rust. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and um, apply a manifest here. Actually, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and show you what this looks like first here in the terminal. You'll see here we're creating um, some configuration. If you're familiar with Kubernetes, then you'll know what this is. I'm not going to go over every object. Um, but here we have a pod, and this pod is the base unit of Kubernetes. It's what runs your thing, whatever it might be. And right here, we're actually pulling down a WebAssembly module from an ACR registry. So you can store WebAssembly modules there and, and Helm charts there and containers there, all sorts of things. And so we're pulling that down and then we're going to run that WebAssembly module inside of Kubernetes. And this is targeting um, only specific nodes, ones that run WebAssembly modules. So let's go ahead and do the um, apply of that manifest. And it was created. So we'll see that it should have run all the way to completion. Yeah, see, so it exited with an exit code of zero um, because it, it was just only doing one thing, but you can interact with this just like you would 
um, a normal Kubernetes node. So I can say kube control logs, um, logs, hello world, WASI Rust. And you can see that it, it printed a standard out and standard error. It printed out some environment variables we set. And then also the uh, bacon ipsum, which is our, our funny version of the lorem ipsum uh, filler text. And so you can see that it printed out that all of that information. Um, so basically, like I said, all of this is running in REST. We didn't take any shortcuts. We didn't do anything um, anything to like work around this. This is all Rust, and we're able to implement the same APIs that Kubernetes has and be able to pass through and get this kind of information. Um, so there's that. I just want to pause in case anyone has any questions. And then I think we have um, a little bit more time for one more demo, but let's just stop in case there's any questions that come through on the comments or on Discord. Anything you wanted to add to this, Ryan, while I was talking about it? Anything that I may have missed or glossed over? It looks great. Uh, it looks very simple and um, uh, and uh, really awesome. It's a really cool project. Okay. Well, we're going to attempt. Attempt is the word because we don't. We always have. We have angered the demo gods probably at some point along this. So let's go ahead and go to that um, that example in Crater. So this example is actually really cool because if you're familiar with Kubernetes. Um, this is something that actually takes quite a bit of work normally to set up, and that's why I sh that's why I showed it first. So in the uh, Moose example here, actually is meant to run um, an admission controller and a whole bunch of other Kubernetes things. So if you're familiar with Kubernetes, you're probably like, "Ooh, that's cool." If you're not, you're like, "What is? What in the world is that?" Don't worry. It's there's just a lot of things going on here in the background. You can actually see that there are there's these um, scripts that will allow you to run like for different moose that you're creating and all sorts of stuff. So we're gonna go ahead and give it a whirl um, live. And like I said, this could utterly fail, but why not? We have a little bit of extra time, so I will, uh, I'll go ahead and share that. So um, I believe the uh, instructions you can follow are out here or maybe not. If not, then we're going to be trying to do it from memory, which is always fun. So we're gonna go ahead and start right here by running a, um, we, cause we're running the Crescent node already, we can go ahead and try to run this. So we're gonna go into um, Crater. And the nice thing about Cargo is you can do Cargo run example and then give it an example, which in this case is uh, Moose. And we'll see if it runs for us. So this is going to run basically a whole Kubernetes operator. And while that this might have to build for a second, so while that's building, um, you'll see here that we have um, all these different things that are being implemented, which I'm not going to go into. But it's actually implementing a full um, state machine to handle each part of the moose's life cycle. And there's some funny things in here that we'll see, like the sounds that the moose makes and if it's munching or roaming. See, so we have a state called roam. But... Um, all of these things are are fairly easy to write. So this whole this is a whole like fully featured, if kind of contrived controller. In let me check. I think it's 400 lines. Yeah, 413 lines um, that does all this. So it's a uh, um, if you've ever written a controller in Kubernetes before, generally it's a lot more work um, than a controller for Kubernetes. It's normally a lot more work than this. So let's see if it ran. Oh, oops, I forgot to add features. Yeah, like I said, it decided it had to compile. So we'll see. Oh, good. It's faster than I thought. OK, so this might take longer than I thought. So we'll go ahead and just stop it there. I don't want to. To, to take too much time because uh, Rust builds, because you're doing all of that checking to make sure you're not uh, misusing your data and whatnot, it takes a little bit longer to build. So we'll go ahead and stop it there and just kind of uh, tie up here with the end. But like I said, this is just to get people interested and excited in trying it out. It might not be worth it for you to try and do your whole, um, 
your whole, like everything new in Rust. I mean, maybe you're at that state where you want to try something completely greenfield and new. But um, we're going to put, put up some resources here uh, for you to, to look at. The, the first one being the Rust Lang book. This is basically the Rust Bible. Um, it's the way that it explains every single part of the Rust language, um, starting off really easy and then going into exquisite detail about each of the underlying things. It's, it's a very, very good resource. We also have the link to the Rust SDK and the Crestlet site um, in case you're interested in those things. Um, were there any other resources you wanted to point out, Ryan, that, that would be good for people? Um, no, I think these are the, the ones to, to really take a, take a look at. Okay, sweet. So um, really, if you have any questions for us, feel free to reach out. We're, we're both available. I mean, uh, Ryan is in Germany, so uh, he is closer to the time zone than I am. But um, we're, we're both always available to help out, to mentor, to, to give ideas. And if you're interested in any of these projects we've seen that we've been demoing, please reach out. The SDK, like, like we said, heavy construction right now. So any feedback from people who are trying it out is great. Same thing with Crestlet. We're actually very close. Our next releases will be our um, 1.0 alphas. And so having people try it out and tell us, oh, this is great, or try out new things um, with, with what we're doing is also very, very useful for us to have the feedback that we need. So, um, oh, and uh, we had one question coming in here. Uh, one was, if... If I would like, if I would like to build and run a web API in AKS, could you do that with Crestlet? Um, in a sense, yes, you could use Crestlet for inspiration, but also you can use um, if you're going to be doing it like very embedded into Kubernetes with the kind of CRD things I mentioned before. You can do that definitely with what's called with Crestlet with the Crater um, crate. That one will allow you to uh, build your own controller with uh, sim with it's pretty simple and straightforward. I'm not seeing too many other questions. We'll give it just another second and then probably just tie up. Because it's the internet, we'll have to sit here in awkward silence while we wait for the internet to catch up. And then we'll, uh, and then if there's no other questions, we'll go ahead and uh, end. And I'm not seeing anything else come through. So I think we'll go ahead and call it. So thank you, everyone. Um, really, this was a great experience for us. I um, have enjoyed. And also, yes, thank you for the last comment uh, that you uh, hadn't heard about Crater. Glad that we could let you know. Feel free to try it out. Um, and really, thank you uh, so much for coming to this. We, we appreciate all the, the excitement that comes from events like this and everyone's involvement. Thank you.